In a new article for Reason magazine, my colleague Liz Wolf makes the case that while NPR is not state-run media, Elon Musk is correct that it does not need government subsidies at all. Quote, it's time for the federal government to kick NPR and PBS out of the nest. Your taxpayer dollars should never have been subsidizing Big Bird, tiny desk concerts, or those insufferable tote bags in the first place. And they certainly shouldn't now in the area of in the era of audio visual abundance. Liz joins us now to make her case. Welcome back to Rising, Liz. It's been a while. Thanks for having me. So I have a feeling you and I agree on this unsurprisingly, but lay out uh, your case for defunding NPR. For, is it true that NPR really only gets 1% of its funding from, uh, from public funding? Not quite. So NPR gets about, depending on how you count it, somewhere between like 4 and 14% in funding. The way that NPR is actually funded is really interesting. So um, the federal government basically funds the member affiliate stations, which then in turn basically uh, use uh, licensing fees to buy content from NPR, the national organization. And so in a sense, it's like that federal money is flowing into NPR via not exactly the most direct means, but that's sort of been the long established model. Uh, the interesting thing is that NPR kind of wants to have it both ways. They talk so much about how, you know, in the wake of this, they were very offended by Elon Musk slapping the state-affiliated media label on them. Understandably so. Elon Musk is waging an incredibly dumb culture war, and there's really no need for him to act like NPR is akin to Pravda or Xinhua. Uh, that's just not what it is. Uh, but at the same time, you know, they're trying to quit Twitter in a huff and make a big stink about this and, and say that they're not, uh, you know, government affiliated or government subsidized. And it's kind of absurd because it's like, well, you do get funding from the government. And I believe that NPR creates such valuable content that they could easily stand on their own two legs if they decided to just use individual donors, foundation funds, uh, you know, the majority sources of funding that they already rely on. They could easily uh, sort of disassociate from the government altogether. And I'm confused by why they're not doing that. Some people have argued that NPR's programming has become less valuable and corrupted by the fact that they've increasingly had to rely on uh, non-public non funding, whether from donors or for the government, um, and that that has affected their ability to clearly cover issues involving the military-industrial complex, uh, uh, corruption, and the like, which are so important for folks to cover and why independent news is so valuable. Uh, and so what do you make of the argument that actually having a mix of funding sources is maybe the only way, a, a better way to get around the fact that there is capture among corporate media for reasons that we've talked about at nauseum on the show, and the potential, of course, for cap, uh, capture among uh, government funded media and short of pure public funding, which is difficult because people have limited resources and, you know, these kinds of organizations struggle a lot to raise money from the public. You hear these fundraising drives going endlessly on NPRs. They're clearly trying to do exactly that. What do you make of this argument that there's going to be corruption in, in basically wherever you go, whoever is funding your uh, enterprise short of the public, and that as a consequence, having a diversified source of funding is actually a good thing? Yeah. Your point about diversity of funding sources is totally accurate. When reason is fundraising, that's when, when reason is fundraising. That's something we absolutely emphasize uh, and want. But I think that the relationship is actually the opposite. The more disentangled a publication is from government funding, the better. Because ultimately, what journalists need to be doing and what is increasingly rare these days uh, is holding government officials accountable. Um, you know, you see some lefty publications like The Intercept doing this wonderfully. I happen to think that Reason does a really good job with investigative journalism, specifically on criminal justice related issues. And these are things that anger government officials. These are uh, situations where we are uh, the antagonists as journalists. The more disentangled you are from public funding, the more able your publication and your journalists are to be able to do to serve that type of role. Uh, I think that's the most essential thing. And NPR could choose not to take that federal funding and be a lot more successful in their mission. I mean, all due respect, I, I am, I, you know, work for The Intercept. I think that they're uh, having an independence via their being funded by one billionaire donor allows them to have a lot of independence in some respects, but they've also been really criticized for not being as critical of that billionaire donor as other folks. And when you say, you know, people who are not they're government funded. They're funded by I, one single, they're funded by one single billionaire donor. 
Well, no. Well, they were founded with the Pierre Midiar funding, and that was their predominant form of funding. Yeah. And now I think they're trying to disentangle yeah. themselves from that. But if you look to, but I'm just I saying mean, it's important to actually get it correct and to not overstate the case because well, that's to not your, to your to your point. CNN isn't publicly funded. MSNBC mm -hmm. isn't publicly funded. Are we to believe that those outlets are doing better at holding the government accountable than even a place like NPR, which I think definitely has its flaws, but compared to those fully corporately fund funded outlets, seems to me that there isn't this one-to-one -one ratio, this implication that the government funding necessarily leads to the poor outcomes we've seen from so many private institutions. I agree with you that it's not necessarily a recipe for success at all. But it is a necessary precursor, a necessary prerequisite for holding government officials accountable. And look, I, I'm not trying to dunk on NPR the way that Elon Musk is. I'm not trying to use NPR as a pawn in a culture war uh, or a proxy, as representative of obnoxious smug liberals. So I think it is a little bit, and I had a little tote bag dig in my piece. But the thing that I think is important to emphasize is NPR does good work. Uh, you know, when NPR was first established 50 years ago, the media landscape was entirely different. There was a case to be made for federally funding NPR and its member stations. Now, with such a diverse media landscape, with people in rural and remote parts of the country absolutely able to access a diverse array of news sources, the case no longer holds true. And I think it's important for the government to revisit what it's funding. My, uh, I think my issue is not um, a, a substantial concern that their coverage is is being affected by the government as funding source because I, frankly, I don't see a lot of difference between how they approach I issues from a very liberal progressive standpoint. A difference between them and other outlets with a variety of different funding sources you know, towing a liberal progressive line. Um, but the difference for me between NPR and those other, be between uh, CNN and MSNBC, uh, Washington Post and Atlantic, is that I don't, my tax dollars don't go to fund those things where they do go to NPR. So it's almost more of a philosophical objection for me. Like, the, we, we've learned throughout the Twitter files and other things, right, the government is totally capable of leaning on all sorts of uh, platforms and publishers of information, regardless of where their funding comes from. Uh, the, the main difference here, though, is that at least I, I, I'm not contributing, I'm not forced to contribute to it in some direct way here. Absolutely. I mean, to me, as a fellow libertarian, this is by far the most compelling part of the case. The, the media landscape was entirely different 50 years ago. There is no real case to be made for why the government is currently funding NPR or its member stations. Um, the fact that they, frankly, take such a little percentage from government funding is evidence that I, I really do think they could fully disassociate themselves and disentangle altogether. And that would allow taxpayers like us, Robbie, to feel a lot better about where our money is being uh, spent. Uh, ultimately, the federal government has uh, you know, been running a terrible deficit for a very, very long time. Uh, ba a balanced budget is a far off pipe dream. It's something that's just not going to happen. And the fact that we have these line items, which yes, I understand it's a drop in the bucket, but it's a drop in the bucket that can easily be cut. Uh, there's really no reason for taxpayers to be funding this. I mean, that, that goes both ways, of course, right? Uh, the, the U.S. deficit isn't going to be affected by the 1 percent of NPR funding that comes from the government. And when you look, I think we have a graphic here, at the percent of uh, public funding that goes to U.S. media resources as compared to other countries, America is way down at the bottom of the list, if not at the bottom of most lists that I've seen promulgated, uh, behind peer countries um, and and uh, other countries like uh, Israel, Canada, Ireland, New Zealand, Uruguay, Australia, Latvia, Lithuania. I mean, uh, apart from uh, one, one chart I'm looking at, apart from Chile and Colombia, uh, who have fractions of a percent, it looks like, very few people have less public funding than us. So I, I, on, on one level, I take your point. On another level, I mean, the tote bag dig, I think, says a lot, because those tote bags, of course, are not publicly funded. Those are an effort by NPR to Get, you know, to have inducements for folks to pay money to NPR so that they can fund, be self-funded and publicly funded. People pay way more than the cost of a tote bag so that they can get uh, the membership funds so that they can go ahead and fund without the support of the public. So I do think that there is a, 
an argument for why independence from corporate media funding is absolutely a value. And you see that reflected in the choices made in other parts of the world, where certain kinds of entertainment, let's say children's entertainment that is so valued on PBS, where you had Mr. Rogers very famously, I think in the 90s or maybe it was the 80s, testifying before Congress about the value of having public funding that isn't corporate funded um, education funding for kids. Um, at the same time, there is this, this um, I think, too much credulity that has put on, on, the, on what is going to happen if we truly leave, ev leave every aspect of our public sphere to the vagaries of the market. Or do you have any concern about there not being any counterbalance uh, uh, outside of the corporate funding where you have billionaires uh, owning most of our newspapers in this country, if not all of our newspapers at this point? Well, so you're making a few different points. Um, number one, I think a lot of other countries do it very poorly. So the fact that, you know, you know, I Iceland and New Zealand and Israel or whatever are doing it poorly and therefore we ought to continue doing it poorly also isn't compelling to me. Number two, I mean, the fact that our taxpayer, your taxpayer dollars, uh, that Robbie's taxpayer dollars, despite him not particularly loving kids, are subsidizing my kid's ability to watch Big Bird on PBS. Are you kidding me? How is that a reasonable use of those uh, but funds? But I don't drive a car. I can... Should I not pay taxes for the roads? I mean, that's an that's an argument for not taxing. Don't get us going. Well, don't don't get us going. Like, you, 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 don't, you two, yes. Agree yeah, I respect your, that you guys are libertarians, but that is not a mainstream position, and nobody, I mean, very few people in my audience are going to actually agree with you. I think, it's actually, I think it's important to split hairs here, right? Like, you know, there are more defensible uses of government funds. I think many libertarians would say maintaining a police force, maintaining a court system, maintaining roads. These are reasonable things. But then we get into some really, really absurd things, like the fact that the government is funding my kids' ability to watch Big Bird when I could just pay for that the same way I pay for Hulu. There's no reason for Oof. giving limited taxpayer funds for that type of thing to be prioritized when we could be spending more money on homelessness alleviation and, you know, aid for the poor in this Liz, country. I mean, are, fundamentally, it's a matter of priorities. Liz, are the homeless kids also supposed to pay for Hulu? What what type of question is that? I mean... <laughs> I mean, they can find, you can find free children's content yeah. on YouTube. Because it's, on... it's PBS, guys. <laughs> No, people. No, that's no. People are making children's content. All right, so you're gonna buy. You're gonna buy the homeless kids a laptop as well as a, as a subscription service no, potentially. No, I, I think I think you're getting away from my point, and my point is that. It is totally reasonable to say this is merely a drop in the bucket when it comes to overall federal spending. However, we should consider the fact that over the last 50 years, the media landscape has changed, and it's changed for the better in a way that allows poor children, like what we're talking about, perhaps not homeless children who might not have access to TV, but poor children in far-flung parts of the country to have access to YouTube. That was something far beyond LBJ's wildest dreams. And this was, remember, part of a great society package of programs uh, you know, when NPR and PBS were established. The fact that this is sort of this vestigial remnant uh, that we're still subsidizing seems like something that is merely fanning the flames of Elon Musk's culture war and not actually an essential use of government dollars. Mm -hmm. It's worth noting 12 million students in this country uh, have no access to internet. This was a big story during COVID where because schools were shut down, people were having to park in library parking lots and at Starbucks so that their kids could be able to do their homework. I would agree Something that public Elon spending absolutely needs to be spent there. Friday ad with Starlink and, and improved broadband access, right? Like this is something that tons and tons of those billionaires and millionaires that you were ridiculing and criticizing before are focused well, on solving precisely this problem, and making great strides. Elon Musk, chief among them, perhaps. Mm. All right, we got to leave it there. It's, not, Thank it's you. not ridicule to point out that billionaires obviously have an out, uh, outpaced, uh, outsized influence in our country and that we should all be concerned about as much as we're concerned about government influence. Thank far, you so much, we can Liz. We more soon. Thank, Thank you. you.